Pal. Hey there, this is Pete Townsend from Norio Ventures, and welcome to Money Never Sleeps, a podcast that looks inside the head of entrepreneurs and at what makes them do what they do. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is kindly sponsored by Ireland's fintech and financial services recruitment specialists, top tier recruitment. If you or a colleague need help attracting and retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, it is highly advisable that you build a relationship with the team at top tier recruitment. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com and tell them we sent you. This week, we talked to Finn Murphy from Frontline Ventures a Dublin-based B2B SaaS venture firm investing in Europe and the U.S. In a country of 5 million people like Ireland, the venture capital community is about the size you would expect, relatively modest. However, with multinational finance, pharmaceutical, medtech, and broader tech companies all progressively choosing Ireland for the European operations going back to the 1980s, and a well-educated workforce to boot, there's a much larger talent base in Ireland that you would expect for a country of 5 million people. So what happens with the risk takers with a few years under their belts and these multinationals get that entrepreneurial itch? Well, although there are definitely other factors, I've always pointed to these quasi spin outs from multinationals. There are sometimes no more than one woman or one man saying, I found a problem worth solving and I think there's a big enough market for it, so I'll give it a shot. Ireland definitely has a larger startup ecosystem than you'd expect for a country of 5 million people. Like any startup ecosystem, it eats seed funding. So in a roundabout way, that brings us back to Finn Murphy from Frontline Ventures. So he's been quite transparent about what he looks for in pre-seed stage companies, specifically in his specialty of B2B SaaS, which is business-to-business software as a service. Specifically, with one of his blogs in 2019, we covered his framework for founders on what to expect from VCs investing at the pre-seed level in episode 68. So I thought it was a good idea to go a bit deeper with Finn on this week's episode of Money Never Sleeps. Money Never Sleeps, pal. Here we go again. Welcome to Money Never Sleeps. We're recording today from the home studio, and we're on with Finn Murphy, principal at Frontline Ventures here in Dublin, venture capital firm backing B2B SaaS companies with international ambitions, investing in seed stage European startups, as well as growth stage US companies coming to Europe. In addition to their Dublin HQ, Frontline also have a presence in San Francisco and in London, and they've invested in the likes of Pointy, which was recently acquired by Google, Currency Fair, Finborn, and ClearBank, just to name a few that are going to be important to our listeners that actually have a fintech mindset. Finn recently had his two-year anniversary with Frontline and is a board member or observer on Frontline investments such as Pathfinder, Umba, CloudSmith, Modules, Swig, and Evervault, amongst others. Beyond venture investing, there's a lot more to Finn Murphy, but we'll get into that in a minute. So after that long intro, finally, welcome to the show, Finn. Great. Thanks so much for having me on, Pete. And uh, yeah, strange to be on the show after a previous show covered a piece of content that I wrote. I know. I know. Like you said at the time, it was a bit meta. Mm. Um, And our, our listeners will know that, you know, we already did that show covering your blog post and the, the, the teardown of it, of what mm. you think about the pre-seed investments. And, you know, we did that because it was like reading some of my own thoughts aloud that we can, we could talk about a little bit later on. Um, and that one came to, together a bit at the last minute as my co-host Owen Fitzgerald, mm. he was supposed to join me for that episode. Um, and we recorded that at Head Stuff, which is right across from your HQ there mm. in town, but he couldn't make it at the last minute. So that was my first and hopefully only monologue monologue episode um and our producer conan brophy he stuck in some like massage music in the background there you know just to uh to to ease it for the listeners but as it turns out i just checked the stats on chartable Hmm. it is the second most downloaded money never sleeps episode out of the 80 plus we've done since 2018 oh wow i don't know maybe you should monologue more often pete i'm thinking about it we'll see uh but that one was a hard one to do i think i it took 20 minutes of recorded content that I narrowed down to like 10 minutes just because, um, you know, lots of stops and starts in there. Anyway, mm. let's dig right into your backstory. Yeah. Tell us about that, your backstory mm. and how you got to this point of doing what you're doing today. Yeah. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so I probably started uh, where I went to university to study engineering, study general engineering, uh, like a little bit of computer, electronic, mechanical, civil, uh, and then probably focused on focus on mechanical. I just prefer it. Like to be honest with you, I like was not the biggest fan of computer engineering and coding. So I was yeah. like, okay, mechanical is the stuff I'm interested in. 
and it turns out like I kind of realized when I was uh, in like kind of third year, sophomore year that, you know, most mechanical engineers end up being McKinsey consultants or investment yeah. bankers. And I kind of was like, okay, maybe that'll be fun. And uh, applied to like a BCG internship, I think like three times and never got even to the first interview. So I was like, okay, maybe this, I maybe I do not have the certain writing style or skill set to actually go into one of those jobs. So I kind of ended up getting it. I was doing a bit of side work on the side. I was organizing events, like parties, kind of trying to make cash while you're in college. And one of the, I ended up doing some work for Web Summit. And I kind of, some of it was volunteered, some of it was paid, but you just kind of ended up getting exposed to that sort of tech world and like at the time venture world, but like in reality, I didn't even know what venture was. I was just yeah. really like talking to CEOs, talking to people running companies. And I was like, oh, wow, what you guys are doing seems pretty cool. And that sort of set me down a path of like, okay, well, like, you know, if all these people can do it, why can't I? Uh, and, you know, tried a couple of different startup ideas in college uh eventually managed to get one of them funded by the university and we kind of built that business uh as with the college we were att attending as our first customer uh spun that out raised a little bit of money uh, and ran that for about a year after we graduated until we kind of came to the point of realizing that we had absolutely like no idea what we were doing or like okay any any idea that well me in particular me in particular had like no idea how to actually run a business so uh, that was an interesting kind of realization where I think you think, you know, it's like that moment of sort of realization when you realize how little you actually know, you, you know, you thought you knew so much and then you realize how little you actually know about anything. And that was uh, that was probably like one of the turning point in like kind of my entrepreneurship journey where it's like, OK, maybe now is like maybe i need a little bit more like experience or time under my belt before i'm like really ready to do something do something interesting here uh and that kind of led me to we ended up doing a deal with another fintech business called plank to basically kind of aqua hire me and my whole team uh, like there were only it was me and five friends from computer science and in, in trinity uh and we then all joined plank at the same time we ran when they were raising their series a uh, okay. And that was great. Like that we we had a great time, but you know, we kind of learned hard and fast. There's again so many things that like at the time seemed seemed so sensible and so normal. And then like now having been in venture for two years, I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe we like I actually can't believe some of that shit happened. And that yeah. that all ended up kind of going sideways and you know, met like met some really interesting people and like had some made some like good friendships while we were working there. But, you know, it came to the point where that business just went totally sideways and I had to jump out. And that coincidentally uh, timed, timed perfectly with when Frontline were looking to hire a new member of the investment team. And they were actually at the time, they were just hiring an analyst. And I was like, oh, like, fuck it. Why not? I might as well throw in an application. And yeah. that was, yeah, that was about two years ago, to around two years ago today. Wow. Wow. And that, that the, the spinoff that you had out of the Trinity Digital ID right that mm. was that was ideally or idly how do you say it oh yeah ideally again like i need to i think like another lesson again you learn is like don't try to be clever with the name of your startup like we were like aha it's like id lee and then like literally every single person we spoke to ever was like ah idly systems and we were like oh god yeah, yeah no yeah. no no you, you you got it right on the fact that you only use four letters mm. right which which is a good one but that and, and I didn't know about the Plink side of things because that's really interesting. I saw Plink on your your LinkedIn profile, but didn't really make the connection there. Um, I've met Charles a couple of times, and mm -hmm. I, I kind of know what he's up to today. But we'll we'll leave that for another conversation. So it was the analyst job that you went for. Um, you got it, obviously. Mm -hmm. But what? How did the conversations go that built that bridge for you from? okay, you know, what I would call in the US, where, where I'm from, mm -hmm. a, a double major in math and, and engineering um, mm -hmm. to doing a bit with, you know, being a startup founder, doing the deal to make that part of Plink, and then, okay, then analyst in a venture firm. Tell me about that kind of that kind of bridge. Yeah, like, I really had no, I, like, I still, I'm like, question at times whether I have any idea what I actually want to do. 
Uh, yeah. And, you know, I'd applied for a ton of different jobs. You know, there was when I was when I was leaving Plank, there was an option to go like work in a as a like consultant for a ton of different interesting blockchain and cryptocurrency projects. Uh, I was like interviewing for our product manager role at HubSpot. I was talking to, funnily enough, Pointy about uh, taking on kind of going in there. Head of growth was leaving and they were looking to get someone to replace him. And I'd been doing growth at Plink. So I was kind of looking to step into that sort of like looking to step into that sort of role. And like all of those things were kind of in the pipe before I ended up getting the offer from Frontline. And I like I, I I had a pretty hard time trying to decide which to do because like I had no idea really anything about venture or like what the job would be. I'd had like some interactions with Frontline and some interactions with VCs while I was running you know while I was running my company and then to a lesser extent when we were at Plink. But I just didn't have the I didn't have enough knowledge to know that it was like okay what is this actually like is it a career is it an interesting job. And then I kind of, I called a bunch of different people and all my founder friends were like, like, you know, like VCs, a load of shit, like don't go to the the dark side. You're going to be, you know, you're going to lose your operator's edge and you're just not going to be able to come back to startup land. Uh, And then I spoke to a couple of more kind of senior people who've been around the block. And, you know, one of them asked me, they were like, you know, what's the, and at the time, you know, this was what I was like, the only thing I kind of had in my head, they were like, you know, what do you want to, what do you actually want to do in the future? Like, what do you want to do after this? And I was like, you know, I probably want to start my own company again. I don't know what that looks like, but like, I think I probably do want to try to build something at some point in the future. And one of the, one of my mentors, who's a general partner at another kind of one of the larger funds in the UK said, look, when you're a, when you're a founder, it's that it's not like you watch the movie it's like you're the producer the set designer the actors like you know you're the director and you pull everything together uh, and you get that like really rich experience from like seeing how it's all put together but at the same time like you only get to see one you know you only get to do that on one movie while he kind of said the thing with venture is you know, you might not get to be the director, you might not get to be the actor, you might not actually get to like really get involved in that many companies, but you get to see so many yeah. that that breadth, that breadth of experience will just like suit, like if you do decide to start another company, not only helping you in operating that company, but also deciding what the, you know, picking the right thing to work on. And that to me was kind of what clinched it in terms of going to the taking the job in VC, taking the job in VC after that fairly you know kind of meandering path along the way. I get it. I get it. I'm, well, I mean, with anybody, if you're good at something, you know, there's a set of instincts in in you that really kind of act as your grounding in business in in anything in life, right? So if that's there, and you know, I kind of sense that in you a bit. And this is just from reading your blog posts and the limited interactions that we've had, Finn, Hmm. um, that there is something there from a business mindedness perspective. I don't think you're going to lose your edge. So, um, (laughs) you know, I, I get it. I get it. And no, and I do agree with, you know, that concept of the more you see and the more reps you get with looking Hmm. at different companies, the more you're able to then present what you think you're going to do next or now really in a better light. Right and more concisely in a more compelling way. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a big benefit to doing this. Mm, no, absolutely. And I think it's, I think that's the, the 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 thing about VC and like it's kind of annoying for anyone who's thinking of like getting into VC is like there's like two the, the only two types of people I've ever seen get into it are people who are like absolutely like dedicated to becoming VCs and they pour their heart and soul and they make it like they make it a part of their lives or there's people who are so close to startup world or like so close to being a founder that they I don't want to say fall into it because like there's still steps involved in getting there but like you you know it's like in order to end up in this position I happen to be in like a a place that I didn't realize was so tangentially close to what I'm doing now, but it enabled me to kind of like slide into slide into this other role without really having to go through that much of a long rigmarole of applying to a lot of different funds or like 
trying to figure out even if I wanted, you know, I didn't have to decide even if I wanted to do the job until after I got the offer, which is a pretty, you know, it's a pretty nice position to be in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I get that. And with, with me, like we were talking about before we went on air, I mean, it's been a journey for me, um, but it's been more of a side path that this is going to happen eventually. And I'm nearly there in, into venture um, and have, have made a lot of steps in that direction. Mm. But I feel like it's more of going to be an outcome of the process that I'm doing anyway, right? Which is like you're saying, being that close to startups and being that close to almost being a founder or being a founder for that, mm. for that matter. I, um, so I, I get that. I get that. Tell me about your approach with Frontline, right? Both in terms of how the firm is investing mm. in startups, but also how that's become part of your modus operandi or your modus operandi to begin with, right? Your place in the middle of that all. Yeah, like I, I suppose Frontline was founded about seven years ago to bring a more US style of venture to Europe. Um, you know, and I think that was, you know, that was the experience of the GPs at previous funds that worked in Europe was that, you know, it was still like seven years ago, European venture was just like completely different gravy to what it is today. Like it was still like, I think we still, we still lag the U S in some ways, but like we're more, we lag them by like 12 months instead of by like, you know, four years. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's like the style frontline have generally tried to, you know, we don't make any bones about it where you know, we're only interested in backing founders with really large ambitions, you know, and it's why like kind of the you have, you know, there was the frontline used to have this joke internally that like you just find any of the founders who'd gone and tried to raise money from US funds and write them a check because it like gave you a good benchmark on the scale of their ambition. So like, right. it's, you know, that, that that's really where we started, you know, it's like looking for people who have that like world beating, you know, it, I might be, I might be here in Ireland. I might be here in Denmark. I might be here in the UK, but like, I have just as much of a shot as anyone is building one of these real, like, you know, breakout, breakout companies. Yeah. And, you know, that's probably why we're, you know, why we're a seed investor is like, we're closer. We're much closer as a fund in terms of our DNA at when we're like, you know, we feel much more comfortable when we're assessing people and we're assessing like high level markets than when we're like tearing apart financial models. And yeah. I think that's the, you know, there's, a, there's an element of like perceptive kind of like, you don't want to pat, you're not trying to pattern match, but like you're trying to like see the world today, like really clear as clearly as you possibly can. And then look for people who recognize, you know, have recognized something that everyone else has missed and then back them to go and chase, you know, go and chase that opportunity. So, you know, for us, like, you know, that's investing anywhere from like 250K into a pre product, like, you know, one, one man shop to a two person, you know, you, you know, to sorry, uh, like 20 person company do it a million, do it a million dollars in annual revenue, writing like a 3 yeah. million euro check. So like, that's kind of the range in which we operate. But we've always taken this like you know people centric approach you know like for us you know it's like even like people always ask me this question about valuation so it's like how should i value my business so i'm like well how much money do you need to be successful like at this you know what is success and it's like you know if success is getting the cash flow break even then you know your business probably isn't for us if it's getting to strong growth metrics or a strong product but you know pro product proposition that enables you to raise another round of financing at a markup uh, at, a at a pretty significant, you know, kind of like a two to three X markup. And it's like, okay, how much capital is required for you to do that? And whatever that is, like, that's, that's what drives the valuation. It's going to be, you know, well, we don't really want to own more than 25% of a business. Like it's not in our, you know, it's just not in our interest to do so. And we want to make sure that management teams are properly incentivized and that, you know, if these businesses are successful in the future, that they don't require like big management re-ups because they've been, you know, down, like absolutely like diluted down to nothing because in the yeah. end, you know, that just hurts you on the far side. That just hurts you on the far side as an early stage investor as well. Yep. Yep. No, I get that. Being very realistic about things. We had a Vilo Jordanoff on from 7% Ventures uh, back about seven, eight episodes ago. And he was talking about his benchmark of a billion, right? And saying, mm. can this be a billion dollar company? 
Um, and using your framework that we that we looked at, you can kind of walk back into you know going out going five years back, right? Mm. With, to, to get to today, you can kind of start to get your head around what that might look like in terms of the market size as well. Um, but just talking about your blog post, you did one more recently in February mm. where you were talking about the next decade of Irish startups will look nothing like the last. Mm. Um, do you think that COVID-19 has been a bump in the road or potentially an accelerator to some of this? What are some of the, the, the observations from the last six to eight weeks or so in terms of all this? Yeah, I, I think COVID will, you know, it's very tough to know. Like, you know, I, I think COVID will pass. It's the long term economic damage that's the thing that's really going to there will be less moderately successful companies like guaranteed there'll be a lot i think there'll be a lot less moderately successful companies but i yeah. think there will be the same number of breakout companies as there would have been before and i think that was my you know it's like i we I made this joke at a, i was talking to another venture capitalist and like you know there's only been one billion dollar software i like you know it's not even an outcome yet there's only been one billion dollar valuation in software in ireland in the last like eight years you know in the last eight nine years and that, yeah. that's intercom like that's not good enough to be no to be an invest like you know as an investor if you're just investing in ireland that means you have to be getting that like old school style ownership like you know you need to be owning like 25 30 percent of these companies if they're not exiting for big you know if the outcomes aren't sufficiently large so i think like my view was you know, it's really hard to be what you can't see. And like, I think progressively as the world's become more globalized and like, you know, this like secrets of Sand Hill, secrets of Silicon Valley, like stuff kind of starts to permeate more beyond the Bay Area. And, you know, even the talent that is required to build these companies also permeates out, whether that's, you know, like, you know, DocuSign having their security team based in Dublin, whether it's Zendesk having their mobile engineering team, whether it's, you know, HubSpot having their growth product team, you know, all of those things, you know, even so, like Zalando have their data science, like their whole data science org is like down opposite Google in Grand Canal Dock. You know, it's a really simple prediction to get right because like, obviously they're going to be different. But it's just like, you know, technology has moved on, business models have moved on. But I think like the difference that I see is all of the ingredients are there to produce five intercoms. And it's partly, you know, the only thing rate limiting that is those companies access to capital, which I think is a problem that's been solved by opening up of international, you know, Kleiner, Kleiner, Greylock, Axel, Index and Sequoia all did their first, you know, early stage Irish investments in the last 12 months like that, you know, you can take that as a like once off or you can take it as like oh they've looked here once and that means they're going to start looking here again so i think the capital problem is solved the like problem the next problem is like talent like can these companies actually hire enough high quality people in dublin or do they end up having to shift operation do they you know eventually get to a scale and they have to move to san francisco or they have to move to london or they have to move to berlin and i think covid to a certain extent like provided the companies are well funded which I think the like you know the breakout performers will be. I think it 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 can be you know there will there will be opportunities to hire really good people who are becoming available because their jobs are kind of either have been made redundant or you know are not necessary or companies they're working for shut down in other sector you know in other parts of the kind of technology industry. Yeah, I get that. I get that. And you know that next wave happening. It's continuing to develop here in Ireland, right? And, you know, I always say that Ireland punches above its weight in a number of areas compared to its population, mm. especially in the financial services sector where I'm from. But so much of that financial services sector that is international financial services, they really don't know what's going on uh, at the early stage scene here. They mm. just don't see it because it's not that prevalent and it's not that readily available to see right in front of them. Hmm. Um, but it's like any small country, we are 5 million people, right? This startup ecosystem that we have here is a small part of the overall economy, a small part of the overall working world. And I think it's just, um, it's going to take time for that to develop even more. Now that all the pieces are here, it's just going to take some time to get there. 
Do you see anything in terms of how those companies, you know, stay in Ireland and do grow as an Irish company versus growing as a U.S. company or as a U.K. company? Mm, yeah, I, I, like I think there's, you know, there's there's going to be no choice for a lot of these companies. Like you will have to open U.S. sales offices. Like, you know, you may have to offer a, open a U.K. sales office. I think it's more like, you know, whether the the beating heart, so so to speak, of the company can stay in Ireland long enough. And, you know, you can bring in exact, you can bring in an exact layer that can help build the company out. Like, I, I would say the only thing, the, the biggest rate limiting factor on, you know, scale up staying in Ireland is there are like a decent amount of people in Ireland who know how to operate and run a business that's going from, say, one to 10, you know, going from one to $10 million in annual revenue. There are very, very few who know what, you know, how to take a business from 10 to 100. And there are basically none who know how to take a business from 100 to a billion. And I think like that's where you end up running to the rate limiting factor of like actual talent and expertise in operators that know how to cover those areas. So like, you know, it's eventually companies will come to it's like having a VP market, you know, having a great SaaS VP marketing. There's just almost none who have actually done it in Ireland and you can take a chance on people, but like, you know, even in terms of mentorship, there's not even, there's no one in the local geography, closest people are in London. Most of the people are in New York or San Francisco. And I think like, this is why this generation of Irish startups, you know, that's either a problem that continues ad infinitum or you eventually get a generation that kind of take those chances and bring in those execs and like train either train them here or move them to Ireland. Uh, but it's like, you know, that is a very, I like, I think that's the hardest thing to overcome in terms of these companies eventually moving their center of gravity to the U S and, you know, the tax incentive, like, you know, you can, it's, it comes down to things like tax incentives. It comes down to things like housing. It comes down to things like schooling, like, you know, is it easier for you to convince these incredible people to move their entire lives to a different country? Or is it easier for you to move your uh, company decision-making apparatus to the U S and often it's the latter. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the, the thing is, does, you know, this new normal, and I don't know what that new normal is going to look like. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to be different. Does that mean that more companies can stay put? Or is it still going to be, you need to have that physical in-your-face presence, um, especially in something like B2B SaaS, um, where, you know, that uh, there is still an element, obviously, of enterprise sales that's involved with all this. Do, you know, are we, do, do you think we're going to go back to that? Or will any of this, these big new massive efforts for people to virtualize their sales process um, over the last couple of months? Yeah. Will that start to change things a bit? Yeah, like I, I think, you know, there's the thing is, if you talk to any remote, like fully remote business, like so many of them will say it's like, God, I wish we could get more FaceTime with decision makers on our team. Um, and I think like, yeah, absolutely. This is going to make it more likely that people like look at remote models. But I think like when it comes to running like these massive businesses at scale, you know, there's GitLab have shown you can do it. Uh, Zapier have shown you you can do it. But I think a lot of companies will still want their exact, you know, their exact decision making teams to be in the same geography, or you know, they will want them to have a co located office. Uh, and I like I can see it becoming easier to do remote. You know, it can be easier to spin up a remote sales team. It can be easier to spin up remote engineering. But you know, I. I'm yet to be fully on board with the idea that the brain trust of a company can get by purely interacting over video conference. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's from experience of like talking to companies that do that right now, you know, that do that right now. And they find it, they say like, you can absolutely do it and it's fine, but then you get everyone in the room together and, you know, you end up having what was like a month's worth of discussion over video conference in like two days. True. Yeah, I know. Uh, one, of the, one of the boards that I'm on, we do what feels like monthly check-ins with that. That's all video, but quarterly we're together. And though you, you do get so much more done. 
mm. when it's face to face, when when you're actually in the same room. What do you think are, are some of the personality traits of yours that have made this work for you? Why you're still doing it after a couple of years? Um, mm. You know, the traits that have been helpful to you. Yeah. Um, gosh, personality traits for me. Uh, I'm probably like prone to imagining the future. Uh, so, you know, it's like I was playing chess with someone yesterday and it's quite funny. I kind of like imagine what I would like to happen like five, five, six moves ahead. And, you know, it's like, okay, when this happens, I'm going to do really well and then completely botch the current move. Uh, and yeah. weird, weirdly, that is actually not a terrible thing in venture. Like, you know, you kind of have to, like all of these, like all of these companies, there's millions of reasons why they could fail. Uh, and if you don't have that kind of like optimism and imagination to think about like, okay, well, like what if it all, you know, what if it all goes right? Like, what could this be if every, like, you know, if all the cards, fall in their favor and i think like that kind of like imagination and uh, like the sort of positive imagination even if occasionally it's to my detriment in the short term is yeah. useful in venture because it's generally a long-term game uh and you can afford to make small you know you can afford to make small mistakes in the short term provided you know you the bets that you get away and the vision that you can kind of share with these entrepreneurs can play off. Um, I suppose I'm like, yeah, I just, I, I like talking to, like talking to people and I'd say I'm probably fiercely coming from a family that's like fiercely competitive. Like you need, you have to want to win, you know, in a lot of these deals, like sometimes, sometimes there's, you know, the entrepreneurs aren't talking to anyone else. And you get to just like spend a lot of time, like imagining what the future looks like with them, like, you know, quizzing them on their goals, like quizzing them on their team, quizzing them on their plans. And, you know, you can get really comfortable and you can just decide to do a deal together. And there's no competitive nature of it at all. And other times you're like slogging it out with, you know, 10 of the other like smartest people you've ever come across working for a bunch of different funds with different brands, different like portfolios, you know, different areas, specialty areas areas of specialty and like you know if you're not willing to get on a like this was i suppose it's a pain in the ass now but like it used to be like if you weren't willing to get on a plane and fly to some like random city in europe on like 24 hours notice to go have coffee and beer with the founder to convince them that your money is better than someone else's money uh like yeah you, you know you, you have to want you you have to like really want it to actually be up for, you know to be up for doing that because most of the time you lose and you're like, God, that was a complete fucking waste of time. And yeah. You, yeah. And you're like, oh, well, I, you know, I, I'll say probably I'll caveat that with like, you know, you're like, God, oh, that was a waste of time. And then you're like, OK, well, actually, I know a ton more about that industry than I used to. I have a pretty good relationship with an entrepreneur who decided to go with someone else. But like, I still know that entrepreneur. And like, hopefully, if they're successful, you know, maybe they'll have people who work for them who start companies in the future. And, you know, they'll set they'll send them my way. But it's uh yeah, it's a job of, I'd say like the thing, the personality trait of mine that like is least suited to this is the the constant feeling that like 90% of your work output is not like, you know, non-productive. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Mm -hmm. It's that repetition. It's just, you got to keep it coming in. You got to keep looking at things. It, ha, it, fueling that, um, I kind of hear it from you a bit and that fueling that optimism and fueling that imagination comes from talking to people all the time, right? Mm. You just got to keep doing it, right? To get these ideas. Yeah. And like, and you got to listen to like tons of nonsense to hear like, you know, a couple of good ideas, Like you know, every, every founder has a good reason for starting their business. And like, you know, but not every business is well suited to venture. And, you know, sometimes the first time you have a call with someone is like the second time they've ever spoken to an investor. And you're just like, oh, my God, this like, you know, I feel for you, but like you probably shouldn't have made your like second investor call a VC. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it is that like you just have to keep you have to keep talking to people, because if you don't, you don't have any benchmark against which to measure the last person you spoke to. So like, you know. When we meet a, you know, when you meet an amazing entrepreneur, you have to be able to recognize it, and you have to be able to recognize it like within thirty minutes, you know, the first thirty minutes of speaking yeah. to them, 
And that's only possible with like tons and tons of effort, like experience and time and just like really having this knowledge of like, okay, does this person remind me? Do they have any of the same traits of any of the other great entrepreneurs who I've come across in the past? I gotcha. I gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. I, and, you know, like we we're saying earlier, being in the same room as somebody adds that little more bit more oomph to mm-hmm. your ability to read somebody. And when you see the, I don't know, not your, your, not that you're getting that close to them, but where you see the, the hairs on their arms start to stand up when you mm-hmm. say something specifically to them, or you can see their, their eyes move a bit. Can't always see that on camera. That makes a big difference. In terms of in terms of venture overall, with, with doing all of these things, talking to so many people, looking at so many decks, having so many conversations about investing and doing deals, sometimes you can kind of um, get lost in it a bit. But when you step back to kind of get a different perspective on things, who do you lean on? Yeah, I suppose like I'm quite lucky in Frontline where we have a pretty, you know, we have a good team of people with like varied backgrounds and experiences. Um, but like, you know, often it's like, I'll even just talk to other kind of young VCs. I'll talk to friends of mine who are founders and, you know, it's like, I I think the thing is like for anyone outside the like startup venture ecosystem, like, you know, I'd like, I remember sitting with a bunch of friends and I was talking about like the Uber IPO and the numbers and they were just like, man, shut, you know, shut up. Like nobody cares about tech. Yeah. And like, it's like, I think this is the thing that like tech people like sometimes have a, you know, you can see it on Twitter where it's like there's like an unbelievable sense of self-importance because it's like, well, you know, the five most companies in the S&P 500 are tech companies. And I'm like, yeah, like that doesn't necessarily mean that people give a shit about like our network, infra- like, you know, network infrastructure, seed investments. And I think that's the thing, like when you're leaning on people, you kind of have to lean on people within the industry because it is like, you know, it's niche and it's like finding people. I think if you talk, if you don't talk to people who are also as in it or like as involved in it as you are, it can be, you know, people will just be like, this is complete like gibberish and nonsense. So I try to focus on, you know, it's like keep like your work to, you know, have like the group of people who you can rely on to talk about work and like talk about like what you think is interesting, what you think is not you know what you think is not interesting like who are the you know who are the best entrepreneurs you've met recently but then like kind of separate that from you know general life because the one thing i kind of been that was told like you know vc is one of those professions that like becomes a part of like you know it becomes like part of your personality where it's like oh yeah they're a vc or like you know oh yeah they're a lawyer or oh yeah they're an account, you know, investment banker and i think like you want to be able to have that network of people you can lean on for work stuff without kind of making it all consuming and have like every social conversation and interaction you have being about like, what do you think about quantum computing? Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. I I got, I got a good friend, uh, that the industry that he's in, I am working with startups that are going to completely revolutionize that industry. Right. Mm. He doesn't even want to hear about it. He just doesn't care. Mm. He likes doing business with people. He doesn't care about the tech side of things um, or the, you know, things like transformation. Um, And so, you know what we talk about? Sushi, right? (laughs) Just bring it back to sushi. Sushi and beer, man. Mm. Um, So, you know, I, I, there there are things I could bounce off them, but it's just like, you know, let's not even bother. So I, so I lean on them for other things, right? Mm. Um, Finn, look at your LinkedIn profile. I learned a bunch of stuff that I didn't know about you. And I'm not even sure if you know that some of that stuff is all out there and I'm not going to go through it. But tell us, just to wrap up, what's one thing that people wouldn't expect to know about Finn Murphy? Uh, what would they not expect to know about? You know, it's re- retrospectively, you know, it's pe- 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 you'd look at my LinkedIn, you'd be like, oh, this is like a kind of like obvious path for, fi-. you know, this is like, you know, obviously he was like wanted to get into startups and like wanted to do this and, you know, wanted to be a VC or be a founder or whatever. And like, in reality, like I had no, like, I like very little interest in like, obviously, like, I like used my computer a lot, did a little bit of coding, played a ton of Xbox. But like, I wasn't like interested in tech until like two things. I kind of like watched the social network. And I was like, Oh, Mark Zuckerberg's a billionaire. Facebook's yeah. cool. I'll do that. And then I was on a pub crawl working for Web Summit. Like, I was, I was organizing like, you know, 10 euro in on the door of student nightclub nights like this was not like tech the height of entrepreneurship like you like you know i basically like you were going out so often 
that you basically be like, well, I need to take up a hobby. So you'd like fluctuate between drinking and smoking and like standing on the door. And, you know, then I was doing that one night with a bunch of VCs and CEOs. And like, I was just talking to them all. And I was like, you people are all really normal. And apparently you're all billionaires. So like, obviously this isn't that hard. So (laughs) like, which like retrospectively, like now that I'm in it, I'm like, okay, that's, that I was, I was probably wrong there, but like, yeah, I think that was the thing. Like I wasn't that, like it was external factors that like retrospectively seemed kind of silly and obvious that like steered me towards making a series of small decisions that got me to where I am. And, you know, I think that's, that, that's something that like, you know, for very little push either way, I could be doing something completely different. Like I could be a, guy sitting on like a like i wanted to there was a point in time when i wanted to be like a ocean sailor uh was a point yeah. in time when i wanted to be a bcg consultant um this point in time i think when i was like two i wanted to be a tractor and it's like <laughs> you know this is uh i like but i think the thing that i found is like over time you make all these small decisions and like once they start you know it's like once they start layering in and compounding on each other it really does start to pay a dividend. So I think that was, yeah, that'd be the thing. Like, I, yeah, up until I would say, yeah, up until I was 21, I probably had no interest in doing a startup or like starting. I didn't even have a really that much of an interest in starting a business. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. I mean, I, I, I myself went from uh, cop to FBI agent to architect to mm-hmm. astronaut to baseball player um, to stockbroker. Um, and wherever the heck I've ended up these days. Right. So I think at some point you just kind of, like we were saying in the beginning, that intrinsic persona of you leads you down a certain path in your life. And you find that right mix of personal professional that makes sense. But listen, it's been a pleasure talking to you about this, Finn. Um, really interesting to get to know you after covering one of your, your blog posts on an episode. Um, so thank you so much for coming on to the show. Um, and you know, once this is all over, uh, let, let's try to find some time to, to grab that elusive pint. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully it won't be too long away. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Pete. I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Finn. That does it for this week, folks. And thanks to Finn for opening up his mind to help us figure out why he does what he does. Links and show notes for this episode are on moneyneversleeps.ie, so check us out online. Remember, if you or a colleague need help attracting or retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, it is highly advisable that you build a relationship with a team at Top Tier Recruitment as they really know their stuff. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com. Also, thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for editing this podcast. As for me, I increase the odds of startup success. Get in touch through the contact page at norioventures.com. And you can check out what Owen Fitzgerald is up to these days on Twitter at Owen Fitzgerald9. Finally, till next time, thanks for listening. See ya. Money never sleeps, pal. <laughs>